to make sure I can view the full gallery because I love to see your faces. So I see a lot of familiar faces, which brings a lot of encouragement. So, so great to see you all tonight. Uh, as you've heard, Remy Joy, I'm from the South Side, to be more specific, of <laughs> Chicago. And um, I, I, I lived in Dallas, actually, in the Dallas Fourth Worth Fort Worth area for about seven years. So I lived in Denton for a while. I was sharing with the ladies earlier today and I lived in Highland Village for a minute. And then about six months prior to COVID, the Lord relocated me. I got a job offer to work for the nonprofit organization, uh, Hope Center KC. And it's been great working there. It's a neighborhood very similar to the one I grew up in. It's just very good to be around um, children who are experiencing some of the same things I experienced growing up. And so that's been great. My hope for tonight is I'm gonna share a little bit uh, with you of my personal testimony of being a single woman, my personal experience. And my prayer is that the God of all comfort who has met me and comforted me and brought me encouragement in many different seasons of my singleness, that the God of all comfort would comfort you uh, with that same comfort. So I was raised in a home full of single women. It was my grandmother, my mother, and two of my aunts. So all single ladies in one house. Um, my grandmother when she was pregnant with my mom, she married at a very young age, and when she was pregnant with my mom, unfortunately, her husband passed away. So she became a widow around the age of 30, and um, she actually never remarried. And so she was a single mom of four children for the remainder of her life. So experience with singleness, I have it. Uh, my mom married at a young age. She married about 19 years old. She had me at 20. By the age of 23, she had gotten divorced. And to this day, she has still not remarried. We believe that God is able to provide a husband for her, but at this time she is enjoying her singleness. And my testimony is that I've never been married um, and I am a 41 year old virgin. And now hold on, let me just stop you right now. Why I, I see your eyes and your eyebrows, I see them. <laughs> but um, just know that this 41 year old virgin desire sexual intimacy with the spouse that the Lord brings to her one day. So just don't think that I'm a person that doesn't desire sexual intimacy because I do. And by God's grace, only by his grace, uh, he has kept me this far. So that's a bit of my story. And um, I've grown up, like you heard in my bio, I did Christian school from first grade through my master's degree. I've attended a lot of Christian conferences. Back in the day, I probably read every Christian book on singleness that was ever published, right? So I see your head nodding. We didn't been there. We didn't read the books. We've done that. Um, but sometimes in Christian environments, I feel like we can kind of be tempted to carry ourselves as though we have it all together. And let me just tell you, this girl right here does not have it all together. I do not have it all together. I am still in the sanctification process. The Lord is still working on me. And so I'm just wondering if I have your permission, if we can take a little bit of time tonight to keep it real. Can we keep it real? I see you nodding. Let's keep it real. I'm a part of a group called CMLs. We call each other CMLs or Cabinet Members for Life. There's a long story behind how we got together. There's nine of us, some married, some single, and we have something called Keep It Real Sessions. Some of the CMLs are on this call tonight. Hey, girl, hey. Um, and our purpose is to be accountability for one another, to sharpen one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. And when we have these Keep It Real sessions, we are allowed to come completely and honestly, the way that we would pour out our heart to the Lord, we're able to pour out our heart to one another and just keep it real and share where we are uh, currently, like I said, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, without any fear of judgment, um, without anybody being critical. And our goal is to just point one another back to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so I would like to invite you to a mini keep it real session. That's what we're going to have tonight. So if we're keeping it real, singleness, if you desire to be married, if you are a woman in this group who desires to be married and you are single, singleness requires strength. 
And we're going to unpack that a little bit more later. And you know it. And you've probably experienced the Lord giving you strength beyond measure in your single walk. But we're going to talk about how singleness requires strength. Also, singleness can sometimes be a struggle. And I thought y'all I was by myself. So I, I reached out to about 13 of my friends that are beautiful, brilliant, single, successful women. And I interviewed them a little bit about what is their experience like right now as a single woman? Because I was like, well, maybe it's just a struggle for me. You know, maybe everybody, everybody else is just skipping through the lilies. And that, what do you mean struggle? Singleness, like every day is a gift for me, you know? But sometimes singleness can be a struggle. And, and I just want to say there are times in my experience and maybe in yours where singleness can even feel like suffering. And I would say that um, whether you're on this call and you are single because you are divorced, like my mom, or you are single because you are widowed, like my grandmother, or you are single and you desire to be married, but you've never been married like myself. We all know what it's like to grieve the loss of the life that we thought we would have. We may have envisioned something we, when we were little girls, we might've thought I'm gonna get, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I had a little book and it was like, where are you gonna be five to 10 years ago? And I was like, married, four children, you know, and I had it all listed out and I'm 41 and I'm single. Another, that's not in my script, but another thing I love to tell this, uh, some of you all know this lady, but we had a, a great mentor when I was growing up, a phenomenal mentor. And I remember uh, she, she was a virgin and she did not get married until she was 38 years old. And um, I remember when she got married, I was like, Lord, please don't let that be my testimony. And I felt like the Lord was like, oh, don't worry, it won't. <laughs> I just laughed, you know, because the Lord has plans that far exceed the things that we think or we imagine or we envision. And let me tell you, his plans are always better and they're always greater. Um, so it's not always tough. Sometimes we're super grateful for our freedom, especially if you've been married before and like you, you've had to have that experience or you've had children. And so you're like, man, I'm so grateful to be free and I can get up and I can travel. Or sometimes we are talking with our friends who are married and maybe they're really going through a very difficult season. And we're like, ooh, well, praise ye the Lord. I thank you, Lord, for my singleness. And I thank you that I'm not going through that right now. You know, so it's not always tough, but there are days, at least for me and the 13 women I contacted, there are days when singleness can be um, challenging and it can feel the gift of singleness sometimes can feel like no gift at all. So there was once a time in my life, um, maybe about 10 years ago or so, where I very seriously contemplated suicide after a breakup. I've been dating a guy, I thought I was gonna marry this guy. And when, when that broke up, um, obviously I had deeper issues of not understanding my purpose, not understanding my value, not understanding my worth. But I share that because it might be one lady on the call tonight who knows what it's like to be that low. Uh, you might be there right now and you might be just trying to figure out, you know, Lord, I've been praying for 20 years for a spouse. Lord, my, the, the clock is ticking and I would like to have a child if it is your will. You know, you might be that person. Sometimes you're like, Lord, is this thing on? You talking to the microphone? Are my prayers making it up to heaven? And so if that is you, if you've had similar experiences um, or you think like what we see in the movies, like my life will truly begin and it'll truly begin to thrive, you know, like, like we always see in the movies and on television shows, once I meet the right person, you know, once I can start my family, then I can begin my life. Well, I want us to take a little minute to uh, look at the scripture. Um, it won't be on your screen, but if you have your Bible nearby or your phone, you can just pull up the verse. The scripture for our conference is 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. Uh, while you're flipping to that, 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 7, um, I want to give us a little bit of background about 2 Timothy. So we may know that this is the final biblical epistle that Paul ever wrote. And it is the final biblical epistle that Paul ever wrote. He's writing it from prison. And soon after writing this final letter, he is martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. He is writing to a young man that is not his biological child, 
but it is a young man that he loves so dearly. It is as though he gave birth to him, right? As, as though it is his biological child. So let's look at it. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 7, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, Paul writes, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So ladies, if I'm keeping it real tonight, I have to say, I know intellectually because I've been taught it um, that I should not fear. <laughs> and I know I don't have to fear, but sometimes I wrestle with fear. I might be by myself, but sometimes I wrestle with fear. Sometimes I fear, Lord, will I ever get married? Lord, will I ever have a child? Lord, who is going to take care of me when I get older? You know, will I ever get to experience sexual intimacy in the way that you intended it? Sometimes I, I wonder about those things and sometimes I wrestle with fear. And in a society that elevates marriage, it takes strength for each one of us not to settle. It takes strength for us not to settle. We might know somebody who is tempted to settle, someone who is settling. Maybe once in our lives we did settle, right? But it takes strength to be a single woman today and not settle for a relationship that might be emotionally unhealthy or abusive or ungodly. It takes strength. And the kind of strength I'm talking about is not a strength that any of us, are, any of us have in and of ourselves. It is a power that comes from outside of us. And it's a source that we have to keep running to over and over and over again daily for new strength and new mercies every morning. So singleness, and don't let anybody tell you any different. You are strong. Singleness takes strength. Um, it also takes strength to wait on God. It takes strength to wrestle with loneliness. You know, of the 13 women I reached out to, almost everybody said, I said, what are some of the things you struggle with in singleness? They all said, sometimes loneliness. And no matter how we got into this season of singleness, never married, divorced, widowed, we may all be able to uh, relate to sometimes feeling a little bit lonely. So it, it takes strength not to just run out and try to find a quick fix. Um, and to live according to God's word. I want to tell you a quick story. So my mother had a really good friend growing up. I'm going to call her Cindy. Cindy was beautiful. Just everything that society tells you is beautiful. Cindy was that, right? She's gorgeous. She's very articulate, very gifted, very successful um, in the workplace, uh, dressed very well, just, just gorgeous. And she had been dating, I remember when I was young, she had been dating this young man since uh, she was in high school. And so then she was in her 20s or so, they were still dating. We all knew that they were gonna get married. She loved him dearly. Um, when that relationship ended and they did not get married, uh, she was devastated. And many of us can relate to that. Um, and she went on for uh, the rest of her life being successful, being beautiful. Um, but when the Lord took her from this earth, she was, I think my mom told me last night, I think she was 46 or 47 years old. When the Lord took her from this earth, uh, she passed away from cancer. And though we knew she desired marriage and we knew that she desired family, that wasn't something that the Lord had in store for her life. Now she impacted many, just like Paul, how he was impacting Timothy, who was not his biological child, but somebody he's constantly pouring into and investing into and discipling. She impacted many on her job and many people looked up to her, but she did not marry and she did not have children. So when the Lord took Cindy, um, I remember realizing, man, like the Lord's ways are really not my ways. 
and his thoughts are really not my thoughts. And, and when the Bible says, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, I had to realize did not mean I had like a, a, a little genie in the bottle and I just rub the bottle and the Lord pops out and I give him my wishes and he's like, your wish is my command. I had to realize that delighting myself in the Lord, if the Lord is my delight, if he's the desire of my heart, he's always going to give me him, but he's not always going to give me the things I want. He will supply all of my needs because he's Jehovah Jireh, but I have to learn how to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done and enjoy the life that he is given to me. Uh, so let's look back or think back at 2 Timothy, right? So 2 Timothy, Paul is writing it from where? From prison, okay? And Paul is about to be marked. Now, I'm just using my creative imagination here, and I'm thinking when Paul was growing up in school, he didn't dream of or envision himself being in prison and about to be marked. Yet, when we read through 2 Timothy, we see this great joy that Paul has, even in the midst of suffering, and we see this great willingness that Paul has to kind of say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I will lay down my life for you and for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's in his last days. He says, you know, I've run the race. I've, I've finished the course, all these different things. And what is he, what is he doing? He spends his time pouring into, encouraging, uplifting, and investing in others. He's pouring into Timothy, right? And then what do we know about Timothy? If we, um, if you, when you get a chance, if you look back at Acts 16, 1, we know about Timothy, it says that his mom was a believer, but it says his father was Greek. A lot of commentators believe that his father likely was not a believer in Christ. And so Timothy was in need of a spiritual father. He was in need of somebody to pour into him. And um, Paul was doing that. And we also know about Timothy that like myself, his life was greatly influenced by godly women. So ladies, what kind of a godly woman do you desire to be? What kind of godly woman do you desire to be? Do you desire to be the kind of godly woman who, who genuinely says, Lord, not my will, but yours be done? One of the questions I asked the ladies when I was interviewing them is, if you could look into the future and you saw that God had not called you to marriage, but that he called you to a life of singleness, you know, how would your life be any different? And I would say for myself, I think my life would be very similar. I keep doing what I'm doing, but I wouldn't keep worrying and fretting, right? I would just be free and live life for the glory of God and run after the, the dreams and the, the visions and the gifts um, that he has instilled in me. Do y'all remember the story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I remember that one. And so you remember that um, everybody in the land was supposed to bow down to this statue, right? And so word gets out that they're not bowing down to the statue. King Nebuchadnezzar is furious. So he brings them in like, what is this I hear about you not bowing down to the statue? And they're like, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, because Nebuchadnezzar is about to throw them into this fiery furnace because they don't want to bow down. And they're like, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, we know that our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he does not, uh huh, I say, even if he does not, we will still not bow down to these statues. And that's the kind of godly woman I want to be, you all. That's the kind of godly woman I believe God desires us to be. I believe for each one of us, right? God is more than able to provide the, the man of my dreams, the finest man I have ever seen, who I don't have to work another day in my life. Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about? And, I, and we would have the most beautiful children. God is able. He is more than able to do that. But let me tell you, even if he does not, I don't want my heart any longer to bow down to the idol of marriage. I don't want my heart any longer to bow down to the idol of I want romantic love. I don't want my heart to bow down to I cannot be satisfied in my life or I believe God is not listening to me or I believe that God does not care for me because my biological clock is ticking. I'm saying that I know that God is able to provide for us what we're asking him for if we desire marriage. But even if he 
does not. He is a good God and he is a faithful father. Um, and then uh, one thing I shared with the ladies was I feel like Mark 9, 24 sometimes is, is my life verse. If you remember that story, it was a man, a father who brought his son to Jesus. And he's like, Lord, if you're able, please heal him. And Jesus is like, if I'm able, you know, and the man says to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's how I come to the Lord a lot. I'm not here trying to tell you that I've got it all together, that I never have fear, that my faith is perfect, that I never struggle. But what I'm saying is I, we serve a God where we can go to him honestly. We can keep it real. We can pour out our hearts and say, Lord, I believe, help the areas where I struggle with unbelief. And he's big enough to handle it and, and take that um, from us. You know, we are God's creation. We were put on this earth to do his good pleasure. And God is not like man. God is not harsh. He is not critical. He is not judgmental. He is not insensitive. He is a great high priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses. And we are not forgotten. He genuinely cares about us. He sees us. He hears our prayers. He understands. And we can say to him, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And when we fear, if we ever fear, we can run to him and honestly confess where we are. He knows I've been praying for a husband for 20 plus years and for children. He hears those prayers and that might be, he might say yes. And do I give him permission? Does God have permission in my life? What if he wants to say no? Am I going to throw a fit? Am I going to be angry and resentful? Or am I going to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Um, he's trustworthy, he's kind, he's good, and he's for us. In conclusion, um, a little bit after my suicidal contemplation, maybe it was like a year later, um, I decided that I wanted to do the opposite of taking my own life but that I wanted to live my life to the fullest. And so people are always commenting like, girl, we saw you and you were doing this and you were doing that. And I know that that's only by the hand of God. I grew up poor. I work in ministry. Now I work in a nonprofit. I do not make a lot of money, right? But the Lord has been so kind. I've traveled to maybe about eight different countries. I've been able to share the hope of the gospel of Jesus with many different people. I went skydiving there in Dallas. I tell you, I like to jump out of airplanes. Uh, I went skiing uh, in the mall in the deserts of Dubai, like stuff that I never envisioned. This is what I mean when I say God is able to do exceedingly more than all we ask or, or hope or think or imagine. And that might not be what you want to do. Like you might not want to travel, but whatever it is that you want to do, whatever dreams that God has given to you, whatever gifts that he has given to you, pursue that. And even if you feel like I've accomplished a ton of dreams, there's still more things that God has that he has purposed for you to do uh, on this earth. When I was studying one translation for 2 Timothy 1, 7 said, um, keep at white heat the gift that God has imparted to you. And so the imagery that came to my mind for this, I was thinking of a blacksmith and, you know, we've seen them sometimes and they're working with metal and they're trying to forge the metal and, and mold the metal uh, into whatever uh, way that they want it to look. And they heat it up, right? And first the metal gets so, so hot that it's red hot. And then maybe you've seen this right after it's red hot, it's what? White hot. And so this is saying, keep at white hot heat, keep at white hot heat, the gift that God has imparted to you. Pursue your dreams, ladies, continue pursuing them. Who are the people who need spiritual moms in your life? Who are the women that you can disciple and pour into? Who are the young men that need women to come around them? How can you, like Paul did, he's suffering, he's struggling, he's in prison, but yet he's pouring out his life for the sake of the gospel. What are some ways where you can uh, do that as well? So may we not worry, may we not fret, our God is good and he is for us. And even if he doesn't do the thing that we envision he will do, I, I, I believe and I pray that we would believe that his will is even better. All right, uh, let's pray, y'all. Dear Lord, thank you for the gift of your word, mm -hmm. for the gift of your spirit, mm -hmm. and the gift of community. Lord, you said that you will supply all of our needs in Christ Jesus, the creator and sustainer of all. 
You created our hearts to desire unconditional love. Lord, would you meet that need in each one of us in a way that only you can. Um, may we continue to walk with great confidence and purpose within our singleness, knowing that being single takes strength. Thank you for the power, love, and sound mind that you provide to each one of us, your children. Use our lives to bring great glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.